This is Contemporary Communications Conference. My name is Jerry Fialka. Today we welcome Paul Plimley, a composer and pianist, whose music includes European classical, cutting-edge jazz, and contemporary avant-garde. Based in Vancouver, Canada, Paul has been a significant presence in the jazz and new music scene since the 70s. Welcome, Paul. Well, listen, Jerry, it's a pleasure to be uh, broadcast on your show and being a part of the uh, Los Angeles community. And it's going to be a pleasure. I'm looking forward to tuning in to this broadcast myself. So already into the interview, here we are playing with time. All right. Thanks, Bob. What initially spurred your interest to pursue a career in music? Well, you know, before any aspirations of uh, career motivation set in, and I suppose that starts to uh, dawn on people perhaps in their late teens or sometimes a little later into their 20s, I think, uh, you know, what was significant was, was that before I was 10 years old, I was uh, thoroughly in love with music itself, and I felt that, that uh, you know, here was a, uh, a dream and, and an inspiring path that uh, I felt kind of locked into. And so, you know, aside from even my own studies in music, which was primarily piano growing up, uh, I just loved to listen to music, and it really made a very deep connection uh, to, let's say, like the deeper layers of myself. And so this is what was first to develop. And then by the time I reached that age, where I left high school, then, of course, I thought, well, you know, I'll give music a try, although it must be said, too, Jerry, that at that age, uh, let's say between the ages of, uh, you know, 16 through about 24 or so, I didn't have a great deal of confidence, and it was kind of touch and go in terms of whether or not I'd, I'd really sort of dig in and make the most of uh, my musical dreams. Well, who were your first role models, and what did you learn from them? Oh, well, you know, I think the role models, I guess, are really those people, A, that touch you somehow through what they do, and I suppose, you know, the role models are the people that you admire, and then, you know, you can admire those people for more than what we would usually base our, uh, let's say, strict musical judgments on, and you may, of course, uh, be connected to an aspect of their being, which is more based upon how the choices that they have made uh, which affect, of course, the life that they live. So I can tell you some names, I guess. And I know that in our prior conversations, you know, Jerry, we've talked about people. And, uh, and uh, you know, really, I mean, like, I would say, like, probably the first are probably the Beatles, you know? Mm -hmm. And, like, this is when I was very young. This is, this is such that, uh, you know, I saw them on Ed Sullivan when I was still uh, 10 years old. So uh, I was pretty young, but, uh, you know, it didn't take long before uh, the Beatles showed a way which, while, of course, I don't really, you know, pursue that particular musical path or aesthetic, uh, they had such a great vitality, and they wrote beautiful tunes and so on. So that got me. And then a little later, uh, you know, as rock progressed and as I progressed personally, uh, you know, people like uh, Frank Zappa, Miles Davis, uh, Bill Evans, Cecil Taylor, Sun Ra, Don Van Vliet, uh, some of the composers in Europe like Stockhausen, Boulez. Uh, you know, here's already a pretty major sampling of some great composers, players, artists. And, and uh, so all of these wonderful people helped inspire me to want to, let's say, maintain and develop the contact that I had with the spiritual values that were a part of me, but needed attention.
attention that needed the kind of development and building that it takes to make a mature musical statement. So these are, these are some of the people. And, and of course, these names that I've suggested, it's not complete. There are some other ones maybe I'll add later uh, during the course of this uh, conversation. But here were some uh, important people already. And, and so these people show you how beautiful life is in terms of the creative potential within them. And then, of course, they show that you may also be doing something which is going to be inspiring other people later down the line. Right. Thanks, Paul. What was the first piece of music that had an impression on you? Well, man, this is, this is really getting into some, some pretty fascinating stuff, I guess, subjectively speaking from my point of view because of course this happened to me and it's very personal but I'll tell you Jerry that uh, I remember one day I was sitting outside of uh, uh, the house that I lived in up until I guess I was seven so I was probably around five years old and I heard something on the radio in uh, the middle of a sunny summer afternoon and I was uh, sitting outside in the uh, front lawn just by, by myself, and there, there was this kind of radio at a slight distance. And it sounded to me, if I was going to now describe it, that it, was pr- that it was maybe something really kind of basic and straightforward, but like a lyrical sort of symphonic music, a la, let's say, uh, a kind of nice, slow... Uh, rendition by Percy Faith or Nelson Riddle. I mean, these people knew how to arrange music, so it was probably just a beautiful Broadway melody uh, that uh, just just really contained uh, uh, an example or a moment of great beauty, and that and that touched me. And I remember seeing uh, uh, a reflection of my shadow and feeling that uh, that this shadow was something that really was, I guess, connected to something that went way, way back in the past. So it was one of those experiences, very simple and yet very meaningful, too. Yeah. So if the wheel is an extension of the foot Mm. and clothing is an extension of the skin, what is the piano an extension of? Okay. The piano is an extension of the impulse to dream and the impulse to make those dreams uh, a reality based upon the feelings of the person playing it. So we could say that the piano is an extension of a person's state of mind and state of being what is music well you know this is a good question jerry and it's asked often so let's see if i can add a little bit to the uh, psychobabble definitions of music (laughs) creep up when we least expect it but uh, you know they're always around first of all one of the things about defining music is I think we have to recognize that music is something that affects people on this planet in a multitude of ways. And so my definition, of course, will be filtered through how I you know, hear and feel and think about music. However, I'll try to make my definition as, let's say, universal as possible. And I would just say that music is uh, definitely a medium which is based in sound, but that is really, let's say, the tool or process or simply a medium by which the, like as I said earlier, the state of a person 
person's being uh, is such that that will contribute so much to whatever what one calls music as that comes out that's a reflection of the person making it so I'm still talking around things so let me just try and now let's say uh, encapsulate this definition a little better by saying that music is really the expression of the of a of let's put it this way let's talk about music as it's made by one person or a group of people any group of people so I would just say that those people are expressing what is a a matter of their everyday lives their everyday states of consciousness but then deeper than that I think music hits upon uh, the most well inspired uh, aspects of our lives of our consciousness of our beings it's a very hard definition to really come up with anything too satisfying here, Jerry. Well, that's fine, Paul. Um, let me add this. John Cage was told the purpose of music is to sober and quiet the mind, thus rendering it susceptible to divine influences. Oh, I can, I can go with that one. Boy, <laughs> if John was still alive, man, I'd, uh, I'd buy him a popsicle for that one. <laughs> Definitely, and because I, you know that's really kind of lightening things up here. Because you see, what what John is also echoing, I think, there uh, is definitely compatible with uh, the definitions of music as propagated by, let's say, China or India, whereby music is a spiritual path. But you see, what what we witness now, Jerry, and of course, I think you experience something like this too is is that there are now so many roads of different musical styles which uh, not only sound different and uh, have different aspects of melody rhythm and timbre etc cetera, etc cetera, but they also reflect different values they reflect the state of a culture they, they reflect the states of the listeners of the people making the music and so I think there's a direct uh, uh, correspondence between consciousness uh, personally collectively uh, and the type of music being played but for me I guess what I want from music is to uh, express something which cuts beyond and way past a lot of the in consequentialities I hope I'm saying that right in our lives the sense that music reflects integrity beauty it reflects a possibility of having a life which is meaningful which enriches the person the soul which touches people so that they become more feeling and so that they are uh, feeling that life is worth living rather than a disillusionment uh, that, of course, uh, affects so much of present-day humanity. Well, that leads perfectly into a statement by Marcel Duchamp, who said, there is no art without an audience. So, Paul, what role does the audience play for you? Okay, well, of, of course... Aside from the, let's say, like fairly basic situation of uh, them, uh, you know, supplying me with the means by which I can make a living, let's just go into the exact process of the music making itself, which is what I think you're interested in hearing about. And I guess what I would say is, is that the audience has a large effect upon how well I play and how well I connect with the level of music making that I hope to 
reach in my playing and what I hope to reach, let's say, like within any ensemble that I'm playing with, and an audience which is sensitive, which is open to listen to, uh, you know, non-standardized approaches to music making, and is wanting to go on a journey, then that will uh, have, um, uh, let's say, an opening effect upon me and will help me and aid me get to that spot where the music becomes magic. So the audience and me have, ideally speaking, a bonding that unites us all. So music then could be thought of as a, an agent which bonds and, you, and helps to unite people rather than divides them, which, of course, we see in, the, in our present-day capitalist society. So here we are. We're getting political already, Jerry, and uh, <laughs> long live freedom. So, uh, you know, next question. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So you're sort of like the guide on the journey. Yeah, well, yes, and I, and I hope that uh, I'm, I'm strong enough in what I do that the journey is inclusive to all people who are interested in uh, going beyond, let's say, a standard or routine or expected quota of, let's say, personal development. So that, yeah, the, the music is a journey for me, and I have experienced that it is also that similar kind of experience for other people, too. Certainly not everybody, though. You know, there's people who uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, hate my music even though they've never met me. But, you know, like, not everyone's going to like what I do, but I accept that as a matter of course. Well, that's very interesting. You're leading into one question after the other so uh, <laughs> properly here, Paul. Someone wants to understand your music, but they find it too chaotic, mm -hmm. too difficult, and too dissonant. What what would you say to them? Okay, well, what I would do is, first of all, uh, there are pieces that I have written, and there are, uh, let's say, areas of music making that I like to play in uh, and write in that are, I think, more approachable, that have a sense of lyricism, that have a sense of beauty, so my first step, which I think then is a pretty sound step, is to direct these people to something that I do which is less demanding. Because, you see, I think, and this is just a natural impulse on my part rather than something which I've contrived, but I do believe very strongly in beautiful music. So I think I have a bit of an answer uh, that I could share with people. However, I'm also interested in areas of drama, of, of expansion of the, let's say, parameters of music. And by parameters, I mean the rhythmic, melodic, and formal properties of, of uh, writing a piece of music and extending the language of music, extending the possibilities of music making so that I feel that I want to go as far as I can. I don't want to go for a Sunday stroll when I can fly beyond the moon, you see. So definitely I have aspirations and, um, you know, let's say strong inclinations to go beyond the ordinary. And of course, those areas of music are going to, let's say, um, cause, you know, let's say some consternation in the, uh, the listener who doesn't share that kind of musical outlook, who is satisfied with AM radio and thinks that what I do uh, is, uh, well, I don't know if I can repeat it on the air. <laughs> okay, Paul, but Igor Stravinsky said, 
Most people don't know what they like. They like what they know. Why don't people want to be challenged? Well, uh, this is this really, I think, is a matter of uh, people get into their own ruts, Jerry. You see, and I think that people are uh, very much. Uh, and this is not everybody, but there's a large percentage of people which are happy with a very self-enclosed daily routine and they want things very much in a set pattern nothing too surprising they want a regularity and of course this breeds a kind of security and um, everything is expected everything works like clockwork and so the idea of of something uh, uh, whereby they're taken to a concert of uh, Cecil Taylor uh, doesn't jive well, man, with, with that kind of security because, because music, which is challenging, which is alive, is going to make you question your preconceptions and assumptions, not only about music, but about life. So you're just naturally going to run into people who are willing and interested to take the journey, and then other people that is just not for them. And that, that one of the things that one learns too, Jerry, about this is, is that you can't legislate, uh, you know, people liking new music. You know, the the music that is on the frontier. You can only hope that these people will want to give the music a chance and will want to consider that there are possibilities and more than one way to make music. So, you know, uh, Ornette Coleman said, there are as many valid ways of making music as there are stars in the sky. I think it's a beautiful statement. I think it's true. That's that's a vast amount. Yeah, man, you bet. But you see, Jerry, even with the most brilliant minds over the last, you know, 2,000 years, we have not exhausted the creative possibilities of music. Music is still being worked on, and uh, I, I would say that into the next century, we will see very deep explorations of music as it connects to ESP, as it connects to higher states of consciousness, and I think that music will be used as a tool for the development of the soul. And so this gets into some pretty amazing areas here, and I think that in the next century, if we can survive as a species, that, that uh, music and all the arts uh, will still find uh, very fresh, valid, important, creative, and uh, humane uh, 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 means of, of producing works, which, uh, which really bring us uh, further along the chain uh, of, uh, of dignity and awareness. Mm -hmm. jo now, John Coltrane said, knowledge will set you free. Can can musical education increase listener awareness and receptive receptivity? Yeah. Well, you know, yes, it can. I I have found that in teaching music history courses uh, at night school, that uh, almost without exception, people taking the course usually go away with a bro broadening of the frontiers of musical expansion so that they are more receptive, as you're saying. And by simply being exposed to new ways of making music and new ways, of course, that, that are, let's say, a direct byproduct of each and every one of those peoples and, and how their own personal framework uh, you know, influences what they consider to be new or different. 
what I'm getting at is, is that, yes, it can help, but uh, there's also another side to the coin, and that is, is, is that music is more than an understanding by intellect. And here's where we bring in the sense of the feeling aspect of experiencing music. You see, if, if we realize that you don't have to figure intellectually what's going on to dig music, like, for instance, I mean, hey, Jerry, you know this, man, like uh, uh, citing one of my uh, previous uh, heroes, uh, Don Van Vliet, when uh, Don says, right on Trout Mask Replica, you know, there it is, you know, uh, that's right, just dig it, you know, like, 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 just dig the music. He's talking, I think he says that in uh, um, uh, Hair Pie, I'm not sure, it's on side one. <laughs> of Trout Mask Replica. And he says, yeah, that's right, you know, just dig it. Right. And, and it's like, that just means stop trying to figure things out and stop fighting, you know, this music. Just kind of like relax and let it just be. And, 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 you know, you have to just, in a sense, calm your mind down and get involved with it. Now, the thing is, I have also found in teaching and in my own experience that repeated listening helps to assimilate the content of the music. So in a way, by answering your question, I would just say, yes, uh, a, a, a study of the theory and the history of music can be helpful, but I don't think that music is really necessarily dependent upon those things for the music to reach inside and connect with the listener. So I think that tells you the, the let's say, scope and the large territory that music is wandering in, in and out of, man. So, uh, you know, long live uh, the magic of music. Right, and you once again predicted my next question by answering it can preconceived notions confine this awareness absolutely yes but but david friesen said the biggest thing in music is how to listen so maybe you can give an example mm -hmm. of how you actually instruct your students okay. how to listen well this is good jerry you see what what i do is uh what I do is I, first of all, I help to bear in mind upon the, the student that music is a phenomenon that is a direct outgrowth of any culture in which it is produced in. You see, that's, that's actually a very straightforward statement. That means that when we examine the people of Bali, we naturally listen to the gamelan orchestra. We listen to uh, their various instruments. We, of course, if we're there, we see their dances, we see their costumes, and this and that. So, so what I'm saying there is, is that bear in mind that music does not exist in a vacuum, but it is uh, an expression of a living entity amongst the groups or nations of people that we are considering at any given moment. So that means that if we listen to a blues, right, mm. we can first well assume that the blues basically started in America uh, around the time of the Civil War, perhaps a little before, and it's an outgrowth of mainly African uh, 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 cultural uh, uh, aspects of the experience within uh, the continent of Africa, and of course, the transplanting of uh, the blacks and and going through the uh, 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 you know sort of the hardships and subservience that they went through coming from Africa to America produced the great uh, body of music that we call uh, jazz, blues, gospel, spirituals, 
and uh, and up and up to the music of today. All I'm saying is, is is that a slight awareness of the cultural aspects will help. In a, it, it will help you to focus in on what are the properties that make this music unique and what is going into the music. Now, let's just take another example. Let's say if we play uh, uh, a piece by, well, let's just say Miles Davis. And let's say we'll play something from the 1950s period. And so we listen to it, and by and large, it's interesting to note that uh, besides from being another of my heroes, Miles' uh, music generally communicates to a fairly broad audience, and that's because uh, he's a very warm player. He communicates on a feeling level, and he's uh, a master musician in that his melodic, rhythmic, uh, and instrumental uh, uh, tools are so wonderfully developed that the quality is so strong and of course, this reaches people. And so I talk about those aspects. And I, and I also, of course, during the course of, the, uh, uh, of uh, several classes, I talk about the, let's say, uh, the, the area of musical parameters that I mentioned earlier, like rhythm, melody, harmony, the very tools of music, instrumentation, uh, and you know, areas like rhythm, and instrumentation are very important, I think, to help the listener grasp all of the various elements that are going into any given piece of music. So, you know, we approach things from a, from a slightly technical and historical cultural point of view. And these definitely increase the listener's awareness. Oh, they, 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 they do basically without fail because, because the properties within any given piece of music are, are by the very nature of sound itself and by the very nature of being human reflect upon these sort of psychoacoustical features and properties uh, the very sound of the music and the very people playing it. So that's why I, I continually say music is a reflection of the consciousness by those who are making the music and those who, let's say, uh, adhere or, to, to, well, let's say those who adhere to that music or uh, whether they like or dislike that music, that is a reflection of their particular consciousness at that point in time. So yeah, Jerry, it tends to work. You know, it's like it's like a modus operandi that is uh, inherently a success. Now, of course, by getting a grasp or understanding this music, I would say for the most part that helps increase the pleasure. But on the other hand. Uh, there, of course, are always going to be people who, by their temperaments, are not going to necessarily be enamored of any one musical tradition or style. So there's always going to be people who don't dig, you know, the various aspects of black-inspired music like jazz or blues. Man, they're just middle-of-the-road folks. Maybe they're just... Maybe for them, Mozart is avant-garde. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I guess that's not really the road I travel on. Well, what do you think it is about your music that makes people buy it? Okay, <laughs> well... Uh, you like that one, huh? Yeah, well, I'm not so sure that there's, an, there's a lot there for them to buy because I'm not making much money. <laughs> but here's what I would say. <laughs> Uh, I would say that that uh, with me, I think that I have developed a voice in my music making. Uh, by voice, I just mean like the, uh, the ability to make a 
coherent and personal statement, and uh, I have striven to not only uh, develop uh, a command over the instruments that I play, but I also have striven to uh, reach a state so that I feel uh, that that what I release to the public, let's say on CD, uh, is of a standard that is satisfying for me. And I'm usually pretty fussy as to what I consider is of good quality in my playing. I mean, there's some things I do that I dislike, but there's other things that I feel are at a level whereby the music in question is working. It's it's holding together. It's saying something which is either touching or moving or exciting or fun or happy or, you know, in instilling some kind of quality uh, that speaks of the beauty of life, the joy of life, uh, the excitement of life, and and I suppose on a more modest level, that which is uh, saying something, which whereby the music has a sense of life to it, right? That's a very general criterion by which I feel I want to release that kind of music to the public. Right. And are you surprised that they buy it? No, I'm not. But uh, <laughs> I know that sounds conceited, but... Uh, no, that's that's an honest answer. Oh, yeah, you. no, I'm not surprised, uh, Jerry, because... Uh, if I wasn't playing my music, I'd buy it myself. That's that proves your confidence. Yeah, I think so. Well, I I am fairly confident. Uh, uh, you know, by no means do I claim that everything I do is great, but you know, I generally have the options and the let's say uh, ability during a recording to pick and choose that which I do like. Right? You know, so. Uh, uh, I suppose that really helps. So, you know, you know, like, and also I guess I feel that, uh, you know, I've played with some pretty good musicians, and uh, uh, I feel proud of what they do, too. There's people I play with who I think are great, and uh, they were great, you know, long before they may have played with me, but, but I don't think I, uh, you know, shackled them into, uh, into uh, dipping into... A standard by, by which they would feel was below par. Now, most of the CDs you put out have your compositions yes. on them. How do you? What's the process you use to choose other composers' works to okay. play? Well, this is a good question, Jerry. And, and at this point, w one of the things that I've done is. You know, like if we focus for a minute on uh, one CD that I think is outstanding is the uh, Haddard CD. Uh, that's a Swiss label, um, and uh, we recorded a couple of years ago uh, several compositions of Warnack Coleman. Well, you know, actually, just going even beyond Ornette into anybody. Um, the criterion by which I choose is simply that which, A, I love or like in terms of listening to that music or that person's music, and B, and this kind of narrows the field down, it's also a matter of not only what kind of music I like, but what kind of music I'm interested in playing, right? You see, like, um, I really enjoy listening to, uh, you know, Frank's music, Frank Zappa's music, but uh, I'm not necessarily inclined to want to learn a lot of his music. I'm actually thinking of uh, learning about uh, seven or eight of my favorite melodies of his, but in general, it would be, let's say, more in keeping with the way I naturally play music or play the piano to do Ornette's music, I guess because, uh, let's say, improvisation is one of the strong uh, elements 
which constitute the process of my music making. And Ornette's tunes, I think, generally would tend to fall into that approach of playing, i.e. improvising, more so than Frank's stuff. So, you know, if I was, on the other hand, a player involved in, let's say, you know, contemporary classical or, you know, cutting-edge new music, then, then maybe some of Frank's more complicated scores would be my first step or, or, or a, a natural means of identifying with that way of making music, and that would, let's say, uh, lead me along to choose that uh, very, very uh, uh, process of music making. So that's it, you see, it's what you love and what you're naturally inclined to play based upon the way you already do play, right? Right. It's a, it's a matter of natural inclination. Well, you did do a cover version of a Jimi Hendrix song yeah, we did. on your CD, Both Sides of the Same Mirror. That's right. Now, how did you choose Hendrix? Because he seems to be more of an accessible artist than, say, Ornette Coleman. Yep. But indeed, mm. many people probably don't realize that uh, Third Stone from the Sun, the Hendrix composition you covered... Mm probably did indeed include a lot of live improvisation. Yes, as a matter of fact, it did. Uh, you know, we constructed um, uh, 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 what we thought was a pretty decent arrangement for Third Stone in terms of playing the melody and how the bass fit in with this kind of lovely repeating uh, motif that just kind of kept on going through its lovely repetitive cycle as I played the melody on the upper register of the piano. But but uh, what happened there was, was that simply with Jimmy, it, it wasn't so much a matter of thinking that Jimmy was, let's say, more accessible than someone like Ornette Coleman in terms of the masses, but the fact was, was that both Lyle Ellis, uh, the bass player who I've been playing with for many years, and I uh, have... Uh, always been knocked out by Jimmy, even before we met each other. Uh, we both loved Jimi Hendrix, and we just thought, hey, you know, this tune just came up, and perhaps it came up out of the blue. I don't remember us consciously saying we should do a Hendrix tune, although that could have also have happened, because this was recorded, uh, you know, five years ago, Jerry, Third Stone, pretty well five years, summer of 89, and I can't remember exactly how we got to it but we did and and I think that we may well have said hey you know it might be nice to do something which is not at first glance associated with the tradition of music making that we are involved in but uh, nonetheless you know having grown up with uh, the rock music of the 60s uh, it was not that uh, a strange choice, I think, in retrospect. Right. And would you make your music more accessible to broaden your audience? Well, now, you see, here's an interesting question, Jerry, because, A, it's, it's always nice to be able to reach as many people as you can. Uh, it's also nice, uh, accordingly, then, to, uh, you know, reap some of the benefits by, you know, by making a little more money than you would by playing for a very small audience. So let's just say that, uh, you know, those are, those are, I think, natural wishes and, uh, you know, states that, that, uh, that uh, people, I think, would naturally gravitate to. However, um, when it comes to the issue of contriving the music that is inside of you to fit someone's standardized formula for music making so that the music becomes more than anything else a commodity, that doesn't really sit too well with me because what I want is 
to is to make a music which is totally alive within me in terms of let's say this another way I want to connect with the most alive sense right uh, that I can bring to myself and to the music so that it becomes a music which is spiritually alive and prospering rather than directing the music in a kind of calculated fashion which says, well, if I only do this, this, and this, then I'm going to be a hit. And I think that these two different processes are basically incompatible. However, I would say this, that I do strive to make my music as clear as I can and to always uphold a general level of quality. These things ultimately do help to broaden my audience because as I get better and better with what I do and as I make my music more, let's say, defined and distilled to the point of everything I do is, is basically essential in terms of like what I'm saying is, is that every note I play, I want to make it central uh, to the overall musical statement. So I, what I'm trying to eliminate then are dead spots or things that uh, are simply um, ephemeral or unnecessary to what any one given piece of music is about. So... So wait a minute, Paul. We have a dead spot we have to eliminate at this moment. So hang on one moment. We're talking with Paul Plimley. Welcome back. This is Jerry Fialka for Contemporary Communications Conference, and we're speaking with Paul Plimley, jazz pianist and composer. Paul, you were speaking about how and if you would make your music more accessible to broaden your audience. That's right, Jerry, and I was basically going to probably wrap that question up by saying that I am continually interested in getting to closer and closer to the central core of the exact nature of what I feel to be music and what I feel to be, I guess, a little more importantly, in terms of this particular area, what is most central to the music which is already inside me and which I want to bring out 
as strongly and clearly as I can. So by making music with a greater sense of clarity and definition and maturity, this, I think, does help ultimately to broaden the potential of one's audience. However, as I said earlier, the idea of cheapening music by turning it strictly into a commodity uh, is simply, I guess, not really the way my life has gone up till now. And uh, I don't think that uh, I'm very easily going to give up one very important thing. And this important thing is my belief that the best music that I can play is more centered on feeling and letting go of uh, the kind of control that we generally, let's say, uh, operate in, in terms of the mind, let's just talk about this in a general sense, everyone has a mind by which, of course, they have learned to behave and think in today's world, right? So we have our, our customary actions that we, that we go through every day, going to work, how we socialize, uh, you know, uh, the kind of food we eat, uh, you know, the kind of friends we have, what we do in our spare time, blah, blah, blah. All these things... Uh, you know, fall generally under the umbrella of, of let's say, various kinds of, uh, of knowledge and habits that we have acquired. However, when it comes to creating music, we have to go beyond the dimensions that, that are acceptable in other aspects of our lives. And what that is uh, 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 a matter of going beyond is not falling into the rut of accepting con- conventional and uh, let's say attitudes of music which speak more of convenience rather than a determination to want to evolve and a determination to want to get to the most alive areas within oneself. So there's, there's, I think, pretty well what I would say is kind of a long-winded answer to your question, Jerry, but it, but it, it does kind of tap into uh, several uh, areas of music making. So... That's, I think I think that's a pretty complete answer. Thank you, Paul. Um, Pharaoh Saunders said, the more I play outside, the more I play inside. Okay. Can you discuss the differences in your playing outside and inside? Okay. And maybe in, in layman's terms, simply uh, define what those terms mean. Okay, well, okay. How they are generally thought of is this inside music is that which follows a pattern of regularity in the rhythm like like a clearly identifiable pulse uh, and the melodic and chordal framework within which this music will operate in is let's say of a commonly accepted traditional approach so therefore, uh, let's say music which comes out of America, we will accept blues progressions, we'll accept the kind of songs that were made popular uh, by Broadway show tunes and the, uh, the various pop writers from each decade. Now, when we think about uh, that kind of music, we call that inside because it tends to emulate models of music making by which we are familiar with and which have 
a sense of symmetry uh, and a sense of of not uh, upsetting any aspect of the musical apple cart. Now, outside music, traditionally, in terms of its thought, is music which moves uh, beyond the, let's say, uh, you know, relatively straightforward architectural models that I spoke about just a, a, a moment ago, and tends to have a emphasis on the process of music making, which wants to deliver the player and the listener uh, from from that which is too controlling. So. Therefore, things tend to expand uh, beyond conventional formats of music making. So, for instance, the rhythm will tend to be irregular in the way that the solos or the notes uh, or the melodies are played. So outside means outside of generally accepted traditional uh graspable patterns, whether those patterns be rhythmic, melodic, or harmonic. Now, all that being said, I find that the distinctions of inside and outside are not particularly meaningful to me, because, you see, while, while some people might say that John Coltrane's music from the last four or five years of his life is outside. Uh, on the contrary, I feel that the music is coming from deeply within uh, his very soul. And I think this is one of the problems that, A, you cannot neatly uh, label someone's music as being inside or outside uh, because there are many there are many aspects of making music whereby these criterion may coincide in any one piece of music and also I also feel this is that all great music comes from inside the person anyway so uh, uh, if we're going to talk about creativity I think that these kinds of uh, distinctions of inside and outside are irrelevant. Here's another alternative that I would suggest. Instead of outside, inside, why don't we determine whether or not the music that's being played has a quality of sound which is engaging. Uh, uh, if we take the creative uh, input of any given piece of music and examine that, um, then we can see that then that, uh, that, that the music will speak for itself. And all creative music uh, has such a great uh, variety of stories to tell that it's really, I think, somewhat arbitrary to deal outside, inside. And that's why someone like you mentioned, Pharaoh Saunders. Well, again, I think that, that maybe his music is simultaneously deeply inside and yet outside uh, the uh, conventional approaches of music making. But it's generally a term or a terminology that I've never been that happy with. I see. Can can you talk about conscious conception versus the random element in improvising? Okay. Well, you know, one of the magic, uh, uh, let's say, elements or properties of improvising is is that you have with any good improviser years of preparation that go into the making of any solo that they play. And yet, 
in any great music, you also are striving to capture these other elements of, of a deep intuition which speaks of living precisely in the moment by which you're playing, which of course reminds me of William Blake, you know, who says, uh, you know, he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. And you see, what makes improvisation so strong and great is, is that the blending and the convergence of deep preparation, deep knowledge, and, and a discipline which is striving to master the elements of the music and, and the elements of the instrument you're playing, coupled with a sense of steadfastly being totally in the moment, in the present, wanting to go beyond one's norm uh, is, to me, a very, very satisfying and complete means of making great music. So, so this is this is really the secret, Jerry. Is is that you want to include both the knowledge and preparation with the sense of going beyond thought itself into simply being with the music so that you are a medium by which the music is coming through you and is ultimately playing you, the audience, the instrument, the room itself. Thanks, Paul. Miles Davis said a couple of notes can tell a lot more than a complex orchestration. Yeah. Can you talk about the space between notes? Mm. Well, you know, what Miles is really saying is, is that you can say an awful lot with just a small gesture. And, of course, what, what rings true here is that Miles was able to say so much with just those couple of notes. And, of course, then, then we're talking about the depth and musical quality that goes into those two notes that are coming from Miles in particular. So, yeah, you see, like, there's a difference between being right to the point, and generally that is better than being long-winded and vague and confusing. You know, if we compare, let's say, two people either as players or to people telling a story. You know, if you can be concise and yet imaginative and honest uh, with what you're saying, this is better than setting up a, uh, an elaborate maze of uh, sort of like literary descriptive techniques that uh, ultimately take one down the garden path, but, uh, you know, leave them hopping in uh, quicksand, you know? So you got to be able, you got to be able to know what you're saying and say it strongly with an economy. This is, I think, one of the challenges of music making. So I, I, uh, I kind of agree with what Miles is saying here, Jerry. Yeah. And could you please define Ornette Coleman's theory of harmonics in layman's terms okay. and tell us how you've utilized this theory? Okay. Well, it's interesting because, you know, harmonics, I think, is a process by which Ornette thinks and makes music, but I think even in his own mind, is not necessarily totally formulated, even, as I say, within his view. But, but uh, I, I would say, because a lot of people uh, feel a little bit confused about harmonics, but essentially, there's a few things you can do, is, is, is understand that Ornette is looking for a kind of music which goes 
beyond the traditional concepts of certain notes uh, of a of a musical piece being more important to play than other notes he's getting away from hierarchies to equality so that every instrument is has an equal say in playing the music whether it's like a bass guitar or ornette himself playing the so-called melody so we're getting a real sense of uh equilibrium between all the various elements of music and so ornette is saying you know you, you can play anything you want in my band as long as you don't get in anyone's way or in my way and, I, and then conversely i don't get in your way also when i'm playing so ornette is looking for uh uh everybody in the band that he plays with in his harmonic music to create to, to creatively contribute and to contribute in such a way that the music is being built together but everyone is free to do what they want to do and uh, of course this takes a sense of discipline as well but let's put it this way too that that harmonics is really a very natural way of making music. And, of course, you know, all the people in Ornette's bands that play harmonic music have been playing for a long time. You know, they're not beginners, they're not amateurs. These are people that uh, have a mastery over the essential elements of music that uh, uh, they are playing. So. It's not randomization. Uh, it's it's very much a kind of natural being and playing within the music. So what you got to do is just listen to it, I think. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Monk is harmonic, you know, because Monk made the piano a kind of universal sound generating instrument i don't know how to say it better than that but you know harmonics is, is certainly ornette's terminology and he's really built a unique musical language but i think that uh, properties of what he's dealing with also uh, are exhibited by other creative people even playing perhaps in other musical traditions well, you brought up Thelonious Monk, who said, there are no wrong notes. Was he right? Well, you know, I actually think so, because what you can do is if you hit a note which is so-called inappropriate or wrong, you could take that gesture which caused you to play that note in that given point in time and start playing with it. And you can all, always, by, by hitting the wrong note or the wrong placement, which has to do more with rhythm, with placement in time with the uh, musical sounds being played. So you could take that and turn it to your advantage, you see. So I think fundamentally, Monk is right. And also, Monk's statement coincides and is compatible with Ornette's statement that I mentioned earlier by saying there are as many ways of playing, you know, real, alive music as there are stars in the sky. So I kind of think both those guys are right. Now both Ornette Coleman and Cecil Taylor have often abandoned the notion of chord changes <clears throat> They've employed the extensive use of dissonant clusters of tones, and they've both favored the liberation of melody from preset chord changes. Now, to many people, this all ends up sounding like noise. <laughs> Yet, Gregory Batson maintained a fascination with the role of noise in innovation. 
he said all that is not information not redundancy not form and restraints is noise the only possible source of new patterns now Paul could you discuss the paradox of noise as innovation versus chaotic irritation yeah well here, here we go because you see it's it's like saying this if if you have an example of a person who has been blind all their lives and then receives an operation by which they regain their sight um, you know it often is the case and medical studies of course have have, uh, have looked at this phenomenon whereby the patient who has newly acquired his or her sight often feels that they would like to go back to the previous state of being sightless mm. and this is so because it's so painful to be literally deluged and bombarded by this new sensory data which is just so overwhelming that it is literally painful now this kind of uh, analogy that I'm talking about really also fits in with music right whereby when you are experiencing things which are radically different from the norms you have been brought up into thinking are the real way of listening to music or that music which is the right way of playing music this is often definitely uh, let's say subverted by when you encounter people like Ornette or Cecil and so you see, if we think of evaluating Cecil's music by the same criterion that we evaluate Mozart, then unfortunately Cecil won't score too well under that kind of appraisal. However, uh, if, for instance, we look at the way in which Cecil plays as having a diversity also, like other great music, like Mozart has his variety and his different rich areas by which he makes his music, so too does Cecil. However, Cecil does have uh, a special property of great intensity in his music making, for sure. But if we take these clusters, what we say as clusters is really another ordering of tones and this ordering of tones is really i think more better understood as being thought of as different personal creative ways of generating musical sound so that to me is uh, largely, I think, more accurate than saying point blank that all of Cecil's music is dissonant because he's played many, many different ballads on the piano which are very lovely and lyrical and which to me are not dissonant even by traditional systems of evaluating and signifying dissonance. However, of course, you know, like, uh, like you were saying earlier, there are sometimes in the music of Ornette and Cecil whereby things do tend to be easily construed as being chaotic or overwhelming or dissonant. Uh, but I think if you enter these people's music a step at a time, Go, go back to their earlier recordings and just kind of move into it, as I say, uh, gradually.
gradually, then you'll be able to gain a sense of, of let's say, criterion by which you can then live with this music and evolve yourself with this music. Because uh, if you get thrown into it, you know, all of a sudden, uh, it can be a pretty desperate situation fast, Jerry. So, so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but, uh, but I think that, you know, that uh, uh, there is definitely, and I can say this, you know, through my own study of his music and knowing music, that Cecil's music is the result of years of work and of development on the piano, uh, uh, as well as just his general, uh, you know, creative development as a human being and as uh, building and and formulating his own musical language over a period of many years. So, I don't think his music is chaotic or random. It, you know, uh, on the other hand, I think I should maybe be honest with myself and also say that sometimes Cecil's music doesn't always uh, reach me or move me. Sometimes I do feel that it, it, it can verge on the sense of just making a lot of sound which doesn't always have uh, you know, a personal means of uplifting uh, you know, my own uh, space. So there you go. I mean, I don't, I don't think everything that he has played is necessarily great or shows his highest level of music making. Right, I understand that. Yeah, okay. Now, well, let's talk about self-expression in um, music. Ornette says, Jazz seems to be the most honest and freest form of taking the opportunity to see if you can express something. Yeah. Now, returning to John Cage... He, he was talking about being taught that the purpose of music was to sober and quiet the mind, thus rendering it susceptible to divine influences. Now, to continue with Cage, he said, In time, I also came to see that all art before the Renaissance, both Oriental and Western, had shared this same basis and that the Renaissance idea of self-expressive art was therefore heretical. Right. Well, you see, this is, uh, this is an interesting thing because, you know, Cage's ideas seemed, you know, so radical when he was alive, but a statement like that almost puts him in perspective with other areas of a tradition which go back even longer than the ones we're normally accustomed to thinking about. But I like, I like, I like what you're doing here, Jerry, because you're taking two statements, which I think are actually uh, not only valid, but which can coexist together without canceling each other out. And essentially what Ornette is kind of saying is, is that there is a direct uh, and potent action that takes place when a, a creative jazz musician plays music on his or her instrument. And Cage is saying, yeah, well, yeah, that has to do with self, self-expression, which so often is a kind of vanity press. There you go. Yeah, right? and which removes us from connecting to the totality of life beyond the ego. So I see that there are points of value in both of these approaches. For instance, for any conscious and sincere person, right, uh, uh, self-expression which has developed over years and which has gone, which has transcended, uh, let's say, uh, novelty or uh, uh, showmanship or wanting to impress people, 
sort of getting beyond this to a level of music making which does uh, inspire people and those people listening uh, it speaks to, to us on a whole different level and those different ways of making music just based upon the ideas that I espoused there between the ego and something which has value for many people uh, this speaks of I think something of great worth and then I think also what Cage was saying was was that you know music is a means by which we tune into the divinity of life itself right and that's one of the great things of let's say Zen which is what Cage was heavily involved in and influenced by is is that you know you already are enlightened but your attachment to your own habits and impressions uh, are strongly there and you just have to step outside of that stuff and see the bigger picture right so what I think Gage is saying is is very valuable because uh, he's really talking about being connected as I said earlier to the larger fabric of life itself rather than let's say the more infantile or anal oriented modes of consciousness mm-hmm yeah so through pattern recognition we can acquire comprehensive awareness and I think so you know so this is one of the interesting things about music Jerry is is that we can take two statements by two different people like we've just done and see that there is value to be gotten from both of these statements even though on one level they seemingly contradict each other tell it but that only shows the richness and greatness uh, by which music itself is operating on yes indeed yeah now Marshall McLuhan said the artist uses in his waking life the powers the ordinary person would use in his dream life mm. the creative man has his dream life while awake have you ever dreamed a piece of music and played it yeah uh, I uh, once um, uh, wrote a piece uh, Jerry and it was called and the title came in my dream as well and the title was it was a different title it was dear rare d e a r and then r a r e was the second word so it was an unusual coupling of words dear rare and uh, uh, I must say that I've heard some great music in my dreams right mm -hmm. but but it's always been a challenge to try and actually remember it enough to put it down on paper you know or sing it into a tape recorder because it can be a fleeting experience you know you, you, you do it and then you kind of remember this beautiful music and then of course you're trying to you know let's say like put it down on paper to, to uh, you know to uh, document it and it's uh, sometimes a very very um, frustrating and ephemeral experience like that but I think that yeah uh, you know the whole idea of exercising one's uh, imaginative and uh, creative potential is to dream while being fully awake and then by awake we don't mean let's say the normal sort of motor standard of you know walking through uh, you know your your daily uh, regime uh, but rather to do everything that you do with an awareness and a higher level of, of being let's say conscious of the deeper states within you so that you're not let's say like consumed by superficial impulses or, or you know let's say blind robotic
psychotic modes of behavior, which unfortunately infect uh, a rather alarming degree of people, uh, I was going to say in America, but let's let's be fair, everybody, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, let's say uh, you the you know North American way of life has has its share of problems, but of course, you know, people throughout life have. Uh, their own shortcomings, and each culture, of course, has its positive and negative uh, attributes. But I guess, oh, how do you mean, Jerry? Oh, 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 here I am. I'm just lo- uh, talking about being awake. It's just making me tired here. <laughs> hey. You want to get in the dream state? Yeah, man. I think I'm getting there, Jerry. Well, um, we're coming to a close slowly but surely. But since 1977, you've worked with bassist Lyle Ellis on and off. That's right. In the liner notes of your CD with him, entitled Both Sides of the Same Mirror, Mm -hmm. Ken Pickery of the International Jazz Fest in Vancouver Mm -hmm. wrote, This music communicates at the highest level, invoking a volcanic inner drama that expands and contracts in a catharsis of densely packed lines. Like all great artists, Plimley and Ellis have chosen a path without compromise, maintaining an irrevocable integrity in the service of the music. Mm -hmm. I think that's well put. Can you discuss the telepathic communication you've developed with Lyle? Okay, well, you see... Here's the interesting thing is, Jerry, is that there are moments when we play when the level of empathy uh, is so strong that it does verge on a kind of telepathic state in a sense of being highly, uh, 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 let's say, directed towards being sensitive to that other person who I'm playing with. And so, so um, I guess in a way, what I'm saying is, is, is that we developed whatever our music is saying based upon similar preconditions, or let's say, similar kinds of inclinations that make us want to play in a compatible rhythmic approach or wanting to make us play in a way which um, uh, somehow, you know, if, if music is a language, you definitely want to be speaking the same language and then speaking that same language, then you, you want to seek to make musical poetry out of that, right? Mm-hmm. So let's just say that Lyle and I have similar goals in the way we want to take our music, you know, and this of course has to do with the music that, that is, that speaks of all of our activities and goals so that somehow what we're talking about in terms of my writing music, Lyle's writing his music for different groups, somehow in all of these endeavors, there is an overlay or a compatibility uh, that enables us to communicate so fluently with each other. And, you know, what you hear on the various recordings is a result of that and you know there are times when we play when that level is not so at uh, the fore and what happens is that you know we're struggling to find that groove by which you know feels good to us and, and hopefully to other people and to work it in such a way that there is that communication that there is the sense of interweaving of our various musical lines, you know, from coming out of the piano and the bass. So there's 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 something to be said for that, uh, Jerry. But uh, but I hope 
you know, uh, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And I wanted to let our audience know that indeed there's another CD that Paul Plimley and Lyle Ellis have put out called Kaleidoscopes, which is all the music of Ornette Coleman. But played in our own uh, fashion. Indeed. And could you mention some of the other CDs that you would like people to check out of your work, Paul? Oh, sure. Well, we've already mentioned both sides. Uh, Lyle and I did a trio album with uh, the great New York drummer, Andrew Cyril. Uh, that's on the Music and Arts label, and that uh, was called... Uh, uh, I'm just trying to look through the, uh, the list of things here. Yeah. That's called When Silence Pulls. And then there's another CD on the Victo label, which comes out of Canada, but it's available in Tower. Uh, all of our CDs are available in Tower Records, by the way. But uh, I would also mention uh, the CD with Greg Bendian, who's another drummer from the New Jersey area. And uh, this is called Noir, N-O-Y-R, uh, which is black and French, and which was, I think, the album title came from the fact that that uh, a couple of the pieces on that CD have a kind of reminiscence of a film noir sensibility. So that's how we got that one going. Uh, and uh, let's see now. Those are the ones that I would immediately share, uh, Jerry, with the audience. And I might also mention that uh, this summer, uh, Lyle and I are, are recording with a wonderful horn player from uh, New York uh, State uh, called Joe McPhee, who plays trumpet, all the saxophones, and valve trombone. And we're recording in Zurich this summer. And I'm also working on a solo recording which will be out probably in 95 on the song lines label and so that's coming out and uh, as as we speak uh, now uh, as i'm in the bay area in the latter part of may and early june of 94 we're recording a couple of cds uh as well and uh, we will be shopping them around uh to, to uh, get a prospective label who's interested in us. And, of course, all this will be developing over time. So, Well, we look forward to all this, Paul. In our closing moments, let me ask you a few quickies. What is the highest affirmation of success for you, Paul Plimley? Okay, the highest affirmation of success is to be able uh, to contribute to the positive potential of what it means to be a human being and in giving this way uh, one hopes to receive the goodwill from other people who uh, are inspired by this music and then the icing on the cake of all of that is is to be able at least to make uh, some kind of comfortable living by which one can continue to do one's work and get by on the material plane and not to uh, live in a kind of, uh, of uh, state of want, but a basic prosperity, not, not, not to be a millionaire, but just to get by. So that's what I would say uh, in, a, in a very quick format, Jerry. Tell me something good you never had and you never want. Tell me something good you've never had and never want. How about... Uh, uh, sex on a deserted island by which there's no means of escape. <laughs> <laughs> there's, so there's an example and Paul in closing will there ever be silence no there will not be silence there may be peace but there will not be silence John Cage 
who we've mentioned several times in this interview, um, is, is such that he has demonstrated that when we go into an absolute silent room, which in scientific terms is called an anechoic chamber, that with total silence in the room, the person involved will hear a very high and a very low sound. The high sound is uh, their, their central nervous system, and the low sound is their heartbeat. So, hey, Jerry, silence is theoretically not happening, man. We can get to relative silence, but not total silence. All right, Paul Plimley, thank you so much. My name's Jerry Fialka for Contemporary Communications Conference. For more information, please send a self-addressed stamped envelope in care of 2427.5 Glendon, G-L-Y-N-D-O-N, Venice, California, 90291. And thanks again to Paul Plimley, who proves... Albert Eiler's statement that music is the healing force of the universe. So keep playing your music, Paul. Thanks very much for having me on the show, Jerry. All right.